We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. With an excursus over to Exodus chapter 20. But we're going to start. We're actually going to start in Hebrews chapter 12 this time. From one end to the other. From one end to the other. We're just going to go from 18 to 21 to start with, and then we'll make a few comments and go down to the rest of it. The writer says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Uh, probably most of us can immediately put an occasion to this. When was this true? When did they come to that mountain? Well, there's still one thing. Do what? When they were exiting. When they were exiting. This is when they get to Mount Sinai and God is going to give them the law. And the thing that didn't register with me for a long time is that God seems to have wanted a personal audience with Israel. He talked to them. All of that bunch from Egypt out there in the desert heard the voice of God, and they didn't want to anymore. It, it was too intense an experience for them. Look at Exodus 19, verse 20. We've got two things going on. He has an individual conversations with Moses and talks with and about Aaron. And then he has a proclamation toward the people. Uh, Exodus 19, verse 20. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up Mount Sinai, because you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain, and set it apart as holy. Then the Lord replied, Go down and bring Aaron up with you, but the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord, or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people, and told them. And then look at the first verse of uh, chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So God just starts talking. Uh, go over to uh, verse 18. Here's their response. 2018. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a different distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. So he goes up and gets the law, brings it back down to deliver to the people because the people don't want to have anything to do with God in person. God's fear was that they would want to see him so much that they would break out, he says, that they would come up the mountain to try to see the Lord. And their fear is, man, we sure hope not. We don't want to have anything to do with getting that close to the Lord. Now, the Hebrew writer adds one little thing here that I think is, is really telling. Uh, he says that, it was so terrifying that even Moses was afraid. Now you remember when we were looking at Moses' life and his mom and his dad hid him from Pharaoh. They were not afraid of Pharaoh, so they hid Moses for those three months. Moses grows up, kills the Egyptian taskmaster. He leaves for Midian. And the Hebrew writer makes sure that we understand Moses didn't leave because he was afraid. Right? Moses was not afraid. You get to the foot of Mount Sinai, the people are terrified, and the Hebrew writer says, now Moses is afraid. He, he is up against the great I am. And, uh, 
that's not necessarily the job as he thought it would work out. I wonder if if Moses' job description changed at all at the mountain. Did God really want to lead the people by his own voice? Did he want to tell them things, to have communion with them as God and people? Or was it always in his mind that Moses would just be the go-between? The people buy into that. If you know, if it's God's design, then good, but the people buy into it quickly. We don't want God to talk to us. We don't want to see and experience all this. You go find out what he wants, and then you come back and tell us. So there's a, a great divide between God and the people when they're at Mount Sinai. Okay? Now keep going in, in Hebrews 12, verse 22. Right? You have not come to the mountain that can be touched. Right? So uh, the place of fear, the place of loathing, the place where if you even touch the mountain or an animal touched the mountain, you were to be killed. Uh, you can't get close to God. Don't go anywhere near God. Don't try to find out about God. I'm God. You're not. Stay over there. Verse 22. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Uh, The last one for me is the one that's kind of the trickiest. The rest of them are are interesting, but kind of self-explanatory. You have come to Mount Zion. Where is Mount Zion physically? It's up at the top of uh, Jerusalem, right? It's the high, one of the high points in Jerusalem. There are two peaks, and Zion is one of those. It's the place that David and his little army defeated when they first took that part of Jerusalem, and he set up his palace there, and they built the temple there. So Mount Zion is, is that prominent tip-top of Jerusalem. Uh, it is the city of the living God. Now here is he saying the city of the living God as in Jerusalem the physical, or is he saying Jerusalem the city of the living God as in heavenly Jerusalem? He's referring to the first but he's more specifically talking about the second, right? He uses Mount Zion, uh, Jerusalem, as a place of physical reference, but he's really talking about the place in heaven. Uh, You've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Well, do they know heavenly Jerusalem? No, but they know physical Jerusalem. They've been there, probably uh, most, if not all of the men anyway, who were reading this document first century Jews would have made that pilgrimage at some time to be in the city proper of Jerusalem. So he says, well, you've seen that one, but now you have arrived at the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. So the angels are all together and the angels are happy. Things are good. They're singing songs of praise. Uh, One of the things that John sees in the Revelation is thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands all praising. So you've got just myriads of angels who are involved in praising God in this passage. Uh, Do angels ever amass for other reasons? Well, Jesus, Jesus says the Son of Man will come with the angels And part of the deal is that he will bring punishment on those that know not God. So sometimes they're punishing. Uh, Somebody help me. Is it Elisha or Elijah? One of them is surrounded by the bad guys and the servant of the prophet is saying, oh no, we've had it now. And he says, God, open his eyes. Let him see what's coming. And I mean, the armies of heaven are just surrounding them, you know, there are more with us than there are with them. So the angels do sometimes get called into military service, but this group 
is thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Uh, they're celebrating something. <clears throat> uh, the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. Uh, I should have gone back and checked how many times in the New Testament that the church of the firstborn is used to describe us. But who's the firstborn? Obviously, it's Jesus, the first one born from the dead, never to die again. So you've got all of these folks that are part of Jesus, who are part of his entourage, and their names are written in heaven. Uh, when you get to Revelation 20, there are two books that are open. Right? One has all the things that we've done in our entire existence. The other one is called the Lamb's Book of Life. The dead were judged out of all the things that were written in the books. But then it says all those whose names were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life were cast alive into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So what does that tell us about the importance of what we did compared to the importance of whether we're in Christ or not? All of the things that we did are brought to bear, but the thing that makes the difference between whether we're in or out is if our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So here's all these people who are members of the church of the firstborn, and their names are written in heaven. Jesus adds us to the church, and our name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, whether that's a literal or physical book uh, makes no difference whatsoever. Uh, we've come to God, the judge of all. And here in a minute, we'll kind of tie this back in. But God is the one who has the final say in all of this. He had the final say in whether or not there would be a Savior. He had the final say in how to get in contact with the sacrifice of the Savior. And when we finally get to the throne room, he'll have the final say as to whether our names are written in the book or whether we get to come in. So he is the judge of all. To the spirits of the righteous made perfect. How were they made perfect? Sprinkling of the blood. Sprinkling of the blood. Right? They're righteous because Jesus was righteous. It's an imputed righteousness. None of us is good enough long enough, but Jesus imputes his righteousness to us through his blood. So uh, we have a, uh, a uh, group of the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect because of the blood of Jesus. And then uh, kind of in the middle of all this, you have Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. We've already seen back in seven, eight, nine, that the covenant is better for all those reasons. It's better sacrifice. Uh, it's the real temple, not the imitation temple that they built out in the desert. This is the real thing in the real place with the real Savior, right? The perfect sacrifice has offered himself before the Father. And so he's the mediator of this new covenant. And there's no fire and no smoke. There's no earthquake. There's no running away. None of these folks, the angels in their joyful assembly, the church of the firstborn, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. There's no indication at all that any of these folks are afraid to be where they are. They're in the presence of God, but none of them want to be anywhere else. When you're in the desert at Mount Sinai, there's million people in the desert who all want to be somewhere else because they don't want to be in the presence of God. That's not true of any of these people. All of these people want to be where God is. And then you get to that last one, the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than that of Abel. Let's start with sprinkled blood. Why do we say sprinkled blood? When did we sprinkle blood? Okay, uh, on Pentecost, you, you have the uh, rushing mighty wind and the tongues of fire. Go all the way back to the Old Testament for this one. Sacrifices. Sacrifices, yeah. Uh, particularly when you think about the Day of Atonement, the priest would take the, uh, the bull and he would kill it. He would take the blood and he would go in the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle the blood seven times up, seven times down. He would go out and get the goat's blood, mingle them together, go back in, Seven times up, seven times down. You had to sprinkle. Nothing is purified without blood. So we're sprinkled in a sense with the blood of the sacrifice. 
So we, we have the blood of Jesus on us. Uh, and it speaks a better word than that of Abel. Now, I'm sure the Hebrew writer had something in mind when he compares this to Abel, but what's the difference between Jesus' sacrifice and the blood of Abel? That's, that's a huge Abel question. Abel had to be repeated over and over and over. Okay. The blood of Abel is a human thing. There's nothing holy about Abel's blood. Uh, why was Abel killed? Was it Abel's idea? No, no not Abel's idea. Uh, it's Cain's idea. It's a murder, right? Cain murders him. So he takes his blood and the blood cries out to God from the ground. Right? So God punishes Cain for the blood of Abel. But in Jesus' case, it's so much better because A, Jesus is a volunteer. He talked to the father about it the night before. You know, if there's something else we can do, then, you know, let's do something else. But your will be done. So he goes through all of that horrible bloodletting, goes through the crucifixion, so that he can voluntarily be our sacrifice. So his blood is a holy thing. It doesn't just fall to the ground, you know, unused uh, or haphazardly. It's sacrificed on purpose so that we can be saved. So the sprinkled blood of Jesus on us gives us salvation, gives us hope. The blood of Abel was just a human murder scene that God was, uh, you know, was made aware of. That the idea that the blood of Abel cried out to him from the ground. So that's an amazing turn of phrase there. Um, in the Old Testament, the blood belongs to God. When you read through the Old Law, one of the reasons that they didn't eat uh, meat that had blood in it. Uh, one of the reasons that if they shed blood, then, you know, if a man sheds blood, then by man must his blood be shed, right? Eye for an eye, death penalty. Uh, one of the reasons for that is the blood belongs to God. You can't bleed somebody. You can't take the blood for yourself. All of that belongs to God. And when you get to, uh, to Jesus, his blood is so unbelievably precious that it belongs to God but on our behalf. Uh, one of the reasons when you get to uh, Acts 15 and the elders at Jerusalem are trying to figure out how can we have Jews and Gentile Christians together? How's that going to work? Well, we'll just make four rules for the Gentiles. We won't make them become converts or keep the law, but these four things. Don't eat meat offered to idols. Don't eat meat with the blood still in it. Don't eat things that are strangled, which typically is another blood deal. And stay away from sexual immorality. That's the entire law for Gentiles. That's the four things that the elders come up with. And uh, three out of four of them have to do with food. So, I mean, Jews were serious about those blood laws. If I'm going to go to Antioch, like we talked about Sunday morning, you've got Jews and Gentiles eating together. Let's say we have an all-church fellowship and a Gentile brings blood pudding. You know, how divisive would that be for the Jews who grew up, you know, there's no way I'm touching that stuff. But the elders at Jerusalem kind of wisely say, one of the things that your Jewish brothers are going to be thinking about is how you handle the food thing. So think carefully about that. And then sexual immorality, of course, was a huge thing for the Jewish people compared to the Gentiles at that point in time. There was a, a vast difference between the two. Maybe you could compare it to us now. Christians compared to the rest of the world and how we view sexuality. I mean, that's getting more and more of a divide. And so uh, think, think in those terms when you think about Hebrews and Gentiles, first century sexuality. There was just a huge, huge difference. All right. Um, I just want us to read 25 through 29. We won't really comment on them. But one of the things the Hebrew writer does is that he talks about how wonderful it is to be in Christ, but he will follow that up by saying, but be careful, right? It is better than the old law. It's not a place of fear and dread when you come to Mount Zion like it was at Mount Sinai, but 
pay attention. Because if the things that angels taught us were important, how much more important are the things that Jesus taught us? So it's that kind of thought that he finishes the chapter with. See to it that you do not refuse the one who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Now, just, I want to read that one more time. See how positive we are right before he reminds us. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe because our God is a consuming fire. So after bringing us from Mount Sinai where they were terrified of the fire, he brings us to Mount Zion to celebrating angels and the church of the firstborn. And then he says, but pay attention. You're still dealing with a God who is a consuming fire. So don't relax and decide that all of your life is is uh, easy from now on. You still need to pay attention. Any thoughts about any of that? New King James, New King James says, uh, grace, let us have grace instead of work there. But, and verse 28, of which cannot be shaken. Let us have grace by which we may serve God. Okay, let us have grace uh -huh. instead of let us be thankful yes. and worship God. Okay. Now, let us have grace. Absolutely. Those words. Thank word, thank was also the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mean the word have? I mean, that can be coming to us or us coming here. from us. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the grace that we receive calls for grace in return. We don't usually think about us giving God grace, but our response to his grace is an act of grace. And he gives us grace to pass out. Which, which is fun when you recognize that that's what's going on. Because, you know, so much of the time we wonder if we're really getting done what God wants us to get done. And then every now and then you find yourself just in the middle of something where God is using you and doing things through you. And you go, oh, this is cool. You know, and it, it, it's not about us. It's just that we're in the right place at the right time for God to use us to do something he wants to do. And, you know, it's an honor and a privilege and a, it's, it's fun to see. It pumps us back up a little bit, makes us feel like we really are making some kind of contribution to the kingdom. Anything else? All right. Tell you guys bye.